Welcome to Research Like a Pro. Today for our question and answer series, we will be answering the question, how to track emails and messages in a research log. So the question that was submitted is, I'm messaging an ancestry member for information as I have reason to believe she has some records that would help me. Any suggestions on how to record this in the research log? So, the evidence explained model for email and instant messages is on page 113. And this is the quick check model for private holdings, personal email. Then on page 154 and 155 of that section of evidence explained, there's a section on email and instant messages. And so there are about three different examples. And in the examples, the who, is the first element and it's who created the message. So it's the author of the message or email. And then whoever sent or wrote the email message, that's who you're citing as the creator. But you also do include the recipient of the message. And you can uniquely identify the sender and the recipient by including locations and email addresses or usernames in your personal notes. If you are publishing your report or your case study, then you'll want to keep their address, email address, or username private because that's private contact information unless they have given you permission to publish it. So that would be the who, uniquely identifying the person who sent it, the person who received it. And then the what would be the subject of the message. And sometimes with ancestry messages in particular, there is no subject line. There's just kind of like an instant message back and forth type of thing. So if there's no subject, you can include the first several words of the message that you're citing. And for the what, you'd also want to include whether it's an email, an ancestry message, uh, a Facebook message, whatever type of message you're doing. For the when, it will be the date that the message was sent. And if you're doing instant messages and Ancestry, I would classify more as an instant message, then it would be helpful to include the time the message was sent, especially if there's multiple messages sent back and forth on the same day. For the wherein, um, you can include the time. And then for the where is, if you saved the message in your research file folders, you can then cite where you saved the message and your address and location and location because you're the person who holds that letter or email address. So it's in your private holdings, your own research files. So while I was looking at the different citation models for messages, I noticed that there were different ways to do it and just there's a little bit of flexibility there. And especially this question um, is a little bit different than the models because each example that I looked at and evidence explained they were citing a message that someone like a researcher had received. So imagine you receive a message and you want to cite that information. But if you're logging um, a message that you sent, you need to write a citation for the message that you sent. And I almost kind of think this is like a negative search where you put out search terms, but you don't get anything back yet. You didn't find anything yet. You just did your search. So if you sent a message and you want to cite the fact that you sent it, but you didn't receive an answer yet, then you would want to cite your message you sent. Kind of like a showing that I did a reasonably exhaustive research, I sent the message. So um, the ancestry message that you sent also would not have a subject line like an email would have, and there would not be email addresses. So we have to be flexible as we're making our own citation. Even though we're kind of following the model, we have to think through the who, the what, when, wherein, and where is questions to make sure we're not just blindly following the model and not really doing it correctly. So um, recently I learned that Legacy Family Tree Software has this tool called the Source Writer with all the evidence explained models. And it doesn't have every single model, but it did have this email model from page 155 of evidence explained. And so I wanted to show you this example to kind of show what elements are needed for an email citation. So the writer of the email's last name, the writer's given name, the writer's email address, and this comes from a citation that I made in one of my projects. His email address is published online, so I thought it'd be okay. That's how I got it. Writer's city, writer's state and province, 
and then the subject line and the date of the record, which I would say is the date that you received it, the recipient's last name, the recipient's given name. And um, one thing I noticed about this is that it didn't include where you would put that you saved it into your files, like the quick check model on page 113. Um, but one of her examples and evidence evidence explained didn't have the files like that. So if you're not citing a message that you saved into your research files, you can still cite that message. You just omit that part. And I also wanted to show the source writer because anybody who downloads the free legacy family tree software can use the source writer and the templates from Evidence Explained. So I do recommend that you try this if you don't have a tool that helps you write your citations like this. All right, so here's what the research log entry in a spreadsheet looked like when I created uh, an entry for an email that I had received from this archivist. So for the date, I put in the date I rece or received the email. Then for repository, I just put that I sent an email. For the URL and call number, I just put in his, his um, email address instead. And then for searching for, I put in what, I, what kind of record type I was hoping to get. I wanted to find a church record and what location I was hoping it would be in. Then for the source citation, I used that template on Elizabeth Schoen Mills, page 113. And then I just pasted his response here in the results. So he just said there are not any records at our archive for that church. Now in Airtable, I brought this over to my Airtable base for continuing this project. And it looks a little bit different. So let's zoom in on this. So the person I put in, the person I was asking for records about and the person I was emailing, I put in the date that the email was received. Here I put in the, the um, website where I found his email address and I was looking for a church record in Pendleton County, the year of the record I was searching for, then the source citation of the message that I had sent or that I'd received, and then the results. So it looks very similar. So that's how I would put it in a research log. Now, as you know, in Airtable, my template does have a correspondence log table right here. So here's what it would look like if I logged it in my correspondence log. It has the date and then who it's to. Then um, this is actually a link to the people table where I would record his email address. And then it's from Nicole, the email type that the type of message would be email, and you can also put an ancestry in this type here, ancestry message or whatever type of message you're sending so that you can know where to go find it again. And then the message that I sent and the message that I received back. So that's one thing I like about the correspondence log is that it reminds me to put in the message I sent and the one I received. And then if I send another one, I would put that on a new line. And then if he responds again, that would go in the response for the second line. So that's how I would log it. And then I wanted to talk about making a citation for this particular question, which is a message that you sent. So in the research law, you're going to need a source citation. And so if you're logging that you sent a message, here's how you might want to create that citation. So like I said, we need to be flexible with the citation templates. So the template that I showed earlier was focused on a message that I received, but this one is one that I sent. So I'm the creator of the message, so I would be first here. And normally it would say the, the person's location here, but because it's privately held by me as well, and my location is at the end, I don't feel the need to repeat it twice in the citation. So Nicole Dyer too. And then at Ancestry, people have usernames sometimes. And so you'll wanna put in the actual name on the messaging system in Ancestry, which shows up right here. So I put that in quotation marks so people could see that was like the literal name that I'm sending the message to. But because I've looked at his account and his tree, I figured out his actual name is John Jones, which I put in editorial brackets, indicating that that's not what the original message says, I'm adding that. And then um, his location, which you can see on a person's Ancestry profile page sometimes, not always. Then the what is an ancestry.com message, the date, 17 October, 
the time. I just decided for these type of instant messages, I really want to have the timestamp so that I can find the right message when there's more than one. And then I also wanted to have kind of a subject line, even though there isn't one. So I used the idea of putting the first few words of the message, then a semicolon indicating a layer. And then the fact that this is privately held by Dyer with my street address for private use in Tucson, Arizona. Now for my own notes, I would just put my own address, but if I'm, since I'm sharing this with you, I put this street address for private use. All right, now if you go to a person's profile page, often under their name, it will show their location. So if you're citing an individual in Ancestry, this can help make them more unique because if their name is common, like John Jones, you'll need something like their username or their location to make them more unique so that you can find them again. Of course, they'll be here in your message system, but it's just good to put this. If you were publishing this, you wouldn't want to put his username um, um, unless you got permission. So you would just put username for private use with John Jones or something like that to preserve his privacy. Now, if you were doing a message that you received, let's say John responded, and I want to cite that message now, you would put the citation with him as the first person because he's the creator of the message and his location to Nicole Dyer, ancestry message, the date, the time, and then the first few words of the message. Yes, that is our common ancestor. And then I saved this message to my Isham Jones folder within my Jones research files. And that's privately held by myself in Tucson, Arizona. So that's how I would cite a message that I received. And then when you're in your correspondence log, you, you could record it like this with the date. The person you're corresponding with is John Jones, which links to the people table. It's from Nicole. And the message type is an ancestry message instead of an email. So another great resource that talks about this is on Elizabeth Schoen Mill's website, evidenceexplained.com. And it's in her forum. Somebody asked a question about citing correspondence through 23andMe. So you can go read the question and the comments and the responses back and forth where they discuss these um, kinds of questions for citing email messages on um, websites that have their own messaging system like 23andMe and Ancestry. I hope that was helpful as you are logging your messages sent and good luck with making your citation. Thanks.